Okay, folks, so we're going to go first of all into the book of Ephesians, and I'm just, I mean Galatians, and I'm just going to first of all touch on Galatia. Galatia was a province of Rome, and it was during Paul's first missionary journey that he evangelized the towns of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Large numbers of Romans, Greeks, and Jews were attracted to these centers because of their strategic location in Asia Minor. That's modern day Turkey. And there were lots of people who came there because they were busy centers. Parts of, of um, Pontus, Phrygia, Lyconia, Pisidia, Paphagogonia, and Asura were included in the province of Galatia. Folks, this wasn't, wasn't one little church. This was a whole province. It was a whole region. And Paul started churches in all the towns that he evangelized. This is what we see. Now, the author of the book of Galatians is the Apostle Paul. And it says that he was sent by God to the churches of Galatia. The book was written in about AD 49, and the Galatian church was made up of Jewish and Gentile converts to Christianity. Paul had gone there, preached the gospel, and both Jews and Gentiles had come to salvation. Paul wants them to know that the gospel that he has shared with them is the true gospel. And if anyone should share any other gospel, even an angel from heaven, then it says he is accursed because he has perverted the true gospel. And in chapter 1, verse 8, it actually says, let him be eternally condemned. You know, folks, Paul had taught them the truth. Now we have, and you can see this, there were people who were distorting the gospel. And Paul is saying, if you're listening to any other gospel, I've taught you the truth. Don't listen to anything else. And it says that he was astonished that they were so quickly turning from the true gospel to the perverted gospel. When you have the truth... You can't let the error come into your heart and into your mind. You can't listen to the error. And Paul's purpose for writing was to correct the heresy, the false teachings that was being taught by the Judaizers. He was encouraging them so that they would be confirmed in their faith, that they would know that they are saved. Justification focuses by faith alone. It is apart from the law of Moses. And the Judaizers were teaching that salvation was by keeping the law as well as by faith. So you save by faith, but you've got to keep the law or you're not saved. That's what they were basically saying. So Paul wrote this letter to emphasize that we are saved by faith apart from the works of the law. Paul was not trying to please man. He was trying to please only God. So Paul was teaching what God told him to teach. And he was going to defend the gospel at all costs. He wasn't going to let anyone distort the, boss, the true gospel. Paul was taught by God. He received the revelation from Jesus Christ. He was sent by God. So he wasn't going to try to please man. Paul had been a violent aggressor and persecutor of Christ, but he was saved when it pleased God to save him. You know, folks, the salvation of Paul we see in Acts 9, verse 3 to 5, when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and when Jesus knocked him off his horse, basically, where he was blinded, when Ananias came to him, and Ananias had to pray for him, and he was scared, wasn't he? And God told Ananias, and he said, this man will see, you will see how much he has to suffer for me. And boy, did Paul suffer, and he really did, didn't he? And then God taught and trained Paul in Arabia for three years. Paul didn't suddenly know everything. God tra trained him. God taught him. And you know, it was only after this that Paul actually came to know Peter and then the other apostles. And in the beginning, they were even scared. But then they praised God because of him, because he was now teaching the faith that he had once tried to destroy. Paul had gone trying to kill the Christians. He was the one at whose feet the, the, the first clothes of the first martyrs, um, P, um, I think I'm about, um, oh man, I've forgotten his name now, but Stephen was well, laid when Stephen was martyred, when he was stoned to death. His clothes were laid at the feet of Paul, well, Saul at that time. Now we have the false brothers, and saying brothers means that they were believers. They were in the church anyway, but they were trying to bring the believers into bondage. They were trying to get them to circumcise. Circumcision was a sign of the old covenant of the law. It was not a condition of the covenant. You know, the law came in 430 years after circumcision. Decision. Abraham circumcised his children. So Paul would not give in to these Judaizers. He wouldn't give in to these false teachings. The other disciples had recognized that Paul had been entrusted with the gospel to the Gentiles. They knew that Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the Jews. 
All they desired was that Paul, Barnabas, and Titus would remember the poor, which they did. This was almost a condition of apostleship at that time. All the apostles, and it wasn't because they were told to, they had the desire to look after the poor. They ministered to the poor. There's even a time in two, uh, chapter 2, verse 11 to 21, where Peter rebukes, uh, Paul rebukes Peter, and Peter was a leader in the church, folks, but Paul used to, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles, but when some men from James arrived, he separated himself from the Gentiles, and he was in danger of compromising his faith by hypocrisy, and when he did that, obviously, he would be leading others to follow him. These men that came, with the men that came from James, they were of the circumcision group, and they insisted that the Gentile believers need to be circumcised in order to be saved. They were the legalistic Jews. In chapter 4, in verse 14 to 16, it says, when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. It goes on, folks, and, and, and we know this. We're not made righteous by the law. We're made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. If we are under the law, then we have to keep every part of it, don't we? Or we're guilty of breaking it all. And if we break it all, we're under the curse of the law, and we know that the curse of the law is death. The law shows us that we are sinners. We're under grace when we believe, Christ and when we come to him. It is by faith that we are saved, folks. In verse 20 to 21, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Folks, if we could be saved by keeping the law and we didn't need faith, then why would Jesus have died? He would have died for nothing. The false teachers were saying that faith in Christ's sacrifice was not enough, that they still needed to obey, obey the law to do something to be saved. But the gospel of the grace of God says that Christ did it all for us. That's what he did. He made atonement for our sins, folks. He died for our sins. God justifies the sinner without justifying his sin. He forgives us and he puts Christ's righteousness to our account. And we now live by faith. How? Huh? By dying daily to self. How? Huh? Christ now lives in me. And you know, folks, in chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, we see that righteousness is by faith. It says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? You know, folks, they began with the spirit provided by God. Are they now being perfected by the flesh? Is that not for us as well? We begin with the spirit, folks. We cannot be perfected by the flesh. Paul uses Abraham as the example of one who was declared righteous by faith. You know, folks, when God made the covenant with Abraham, Abraham believed God. Abraham was too old to have children. Sarah was barren, and God had promised them heirs. He had promised them a land, but he had promised them heirs. He had promised them a nation. And Abraham, in chapter 15, verse 6, it said, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. So when Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. God preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, and by faith Abraham believed God. And we see this even when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans in Genesis 12, verse 3. He said, I will bless those who bless you, 
and I will, whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's the promise of God. And Abraham believed the promise and it was credited to him as righteousness. You know, folks, we are redeemed from the law. And if, we, if, we, if one lives by the law, he has to keep every part of it. And in Romans 6, verse 23, we've already said the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, so the curse is death. And it's only by faith in Jesus Christ that one is declared righteous. We are justified by faith. We are not justified by keeping the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And this was so that by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. That's why Jesus paid the price for us, didn't he? Because of his love. And this is the promise, folks. He gives us an example from everyday life. In verse 16 to 18, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why the law then? The law was added because of transgressions until Christ, the promise, had come. You know, folks, the promise first came to Abraham and he believed it. Righteousness is never based on the law because we can't keep the law, we break it. And the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ so that he might be, we might be justified by faith. The law was given as a tutor to point us to Christ, the promised seed. This is the message that Paul is bringing to the Galatians. This is the truth that he's taught them. Now they're listening to those who are lying, who are telling them untruths, but trying to lead them back in to the law. And Paul's saying, no, don't listen to them. This is the message that he's bringing, folks. He says in, in chapter 3, verse 26 to 29, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and is according to the promise. We are is according to the promise, folks. Faith puts us into the family of God. We adopted into his family, and now we are legally his children. We are legally his heirs. God sent his son to redeem us, and he sent his spirit into our hearts. So we are no longer slaves. We are sons and daughters. Paul pleads with the brothers who know God to turn away from the legalism of the false teachers. They're bringing this false legalism into their midst. And Paul is saying, don't do this. Don't do this. We're all under bondage to sin. But you know, folks, when we come to know Christ, we set free, free from slavery to sin, aren't we? The Spirit of God now convicts us of sin, and he delivers us from the slavery of the law. The Galatians were in danger of being enslaved all over again, weren't they, by trying to live by the law. And Paul says he's perplexed about them. He can't believe what, he, what they are doing. Now, in chapter 4, Paul uses a story to tell them the truth. You know, Abraham had two sons. He had Ishmael, who was born of a bondwoman. He was the first son. He was according to the flesh. And he is the old covenant, the covenant of the law, symbolic of Mount Sinai. This is slavery to the law. Then we have the second son. The second son was Isaac. He was the son of the free woman. He was according to the promise, the promise of the spirit. And he is symbolic of Jerusalem, of Zion. This is the new covenant, the covenant of grace. And you know, folks, when you go to verse 27, it says, Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Hagar, the, 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 the bond servant, she had many children. And it says more people are enslaved than are free. You know what? Sarah, Sarah was barren, but she's told to shout. Why? Because she has the promise. The seed will come from her. And folks, we are the children of the promise. If you look at that little diagram on the side, I don't know if you'll be able to see it all. But what we have is two covenants. We have slaves and we have the free. We have Hagar, the law of Moses. We have Sarah, 
the gospel of Christ. We have Ishmael, the followers of the law. We have Isaac, the Christians. We have the slaves who are born of human wisdom. We have the free who are born of the divine promise. The slaves are cast out, the, the, uh, the, um, um, the law, those under the law, they are cast out. But as Christians, they are accepted. That is the story that Paul down tells them to show them. And you know, just as Ishmael persecuted Isaac, so we too will be persecuted. Paul was persecuted by the religious leaders, wasn't he? These false brethren were the, persecuting those who didn't revert who did not revert to legalism, those who would not turn back and be circumcised, would not obey the law. They were being persecuted. But what does verse 30 to 31 say? But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. We are children of the promise. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Paul warns the believers that if they allow themselves to be circumcised, Christ would be of no value to them at all. You know, folks, we can't go back to the law. We can't go back to trying to be saved by keeping a list of requirements of do's and of don'ts. They would then be trying to be justified by the law instead of by faith in Christ. They would have fallen away from grace. That's what it says. But in verse 5, it says, but by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. The only thing that counts, folks, is faith expressing itself through love. We were called to be free, but must we use our freedom to live sinful lives? No, we must use that freedom to love one another. And in verse 14, it says the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If we don't love one another, and if we bite and devour one another, then we will destroy one another. We have to walk by the Spirit. When we come to know Christ, the Spirit of God moves into our hearts and our lives. There's now a conflict, a conflict that rages within us. It's between the flesh and the spirit. But in the fruit of the spirit, we have the first manifestation is love. And you know, folks, even that love is God pouring his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We see that in Romans 5 verse 5. So if we led by the spirit, we are not under the law. We will not live like we did before. We will not indulge our sinful nature you know what, folks, in 22 to 23, it speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, and it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. If we live by the law, we will be led by the, by the Spirit, we will be led by the Spirit, and we will reflect the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh, the sinful nature. We no longer the desire things that were once such a part of our lives. The things that were once important aren't important anymore, are they? We have a new heart and we now have God's law within our hearts. The flesh has been crucified with Christ. Therefore, the spirit will be a fruit in the life of the believer. The Christian life is to be lived in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the flesh. This is what Paul is telling the Galatians, but is he not also telling us? It's not a message for all ages, folks. It's for us even now. You know, right through the Bible, there's a principle of sowing and reaping, isn't there? And it's through love that we fulfill the law of Christ. Love will cause us to carry one another burdens, to judge ourselves rather than to judge others. We will do good to others. We will share God's work for them. We will reap what we sow. And in chapter 6, verse 7 to 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. We are a new creation, and in verse 11 to 15, we see those who are trying to come, tell them to be circumcised, to live by the law. It says they are circumcised, but they don't keep the law. 
they want to boast about the Galatian believers. If they get them to be circumcised folks, they want to boast about them because they've persuaded them to be circumcised. But Paul, who bears the scars of persecution on his own body, he says that he desires only to boast in the cross of Christ. The world has been crucified to Paul and he to the world. You know, the world meant nothing to Paul anymore, did it? He was so crucified, he had died to self and he was living for Christ. And in verse 15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. You know, Christ came to be our savior, to deliver us from sin, from the curse of the law. The deal, law deals with what we are and what we do. Grace deals with who Christ is and what he does. The way we can stand is by the Holy Spirit within. We have died to self. We have died to the world. We have risen to walk in newness of life. That's what it says in Romans 6, verse 2 to 4. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus, folks. And in verse 16, Paul ends, ends, ends this little letter. He says, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. That's Paul's message to the Galatian church. And folks, you know, it's also a message to us, isn't it? Okay, we're going to go straight on to the book of Ephesians. Okay, the author of the book of Ephesians is also Paul. And in chapter 1, verse 1, it says he was an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. He was in Rome, and it was in about AD 60 to 63. The book is thought to have been addressed to the church in Ephesus, but it was also intended to be sent on to the other churches in that region. The Ephesians were faithful believers, folks. And the purpose of this book was to reveal God's mystery, the mystery of Jew and Gentile in one body, the church. We're called the Ecclesia, the called out ones. That's what the church is called. First of all, the historical background. Ephesus was a major city in Asia. It's now modern Turkey. It was also a major seaport. And the temple of Artemis, Diana, was one of the seven wonders of the world. And there were many who came to the temple. And there were many local merchants who made their living from making idols and shrines related to this goddess, the, to the worship of this goddess of fertility. That's what she was called. It was a city of magic and evil spirits. And if you read Acts 19, you'll see that. Paul upset their financial security because the people believed all the, the, the false things. And when they came to salvation, they actually burned all their, their idols. They burned all their books. They didn't buy any of the uh, merchandise that were the shrine, to the shrine of to the, the worship of the uh, goddess Diana. And so the Ephesians' life changed. Paul actually ministered there for two years. And in that time, their lives were totally changed, and many, many came to salvation. In chapter 1, verse 3 to 14, Paul begins his letter by blessing God, praising him for giving them every spiritual blessing in Christ. And then he says, he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You know, folks, we belong to Christ. We were chosen by him to be his very own. Holy means to be set apart. We know that. It doesn't mean that we're perfect without flaw. It means that we set apart from the world. We set apart unto God. And then blameless means that our sins are no longer counted against us. Why? Because God took the blame. Jesus took the blame, didn't he? So we are blameless. This is what it says. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. And folks, this is by his pleasure. It's his will. It's by his grace. It's by his love. That's what he has done for us. In him, we have redemption. We have forgiveness of sin. And you know, folks, Jesus paid the right price of redemption on the cross. It was God's plan of redemption from man from before the creation of the world. It was his predetermined plan. And it is according to the riches of God's grace. He lavished this on us with all wisdom and understanding. You know, folks, the grace of God was, it says, lavished. That means poured out, poured out abundantly. He poured his riches out, his grace out on us with all wisdom and understanding, but lavishly. Okay, not miserly. He made known the mystery of his will. And what was that? It was to bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, under Christ. This was in his time, his will, 
and his pleasure. Those who were adopted and were made heirs because of the price, those who were adopted were made heirs because of the price Jesus paid on the cross. That's why we were made heirs. That's why we were adopted, because he paid the price. In verse 13 to 14, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession to the praise of his glory. You know, folks, when you pay a deposit on a house, you own that house. You can move into it. It belongs to you. Yes, you get to pay monthly installments, but it's your house. And you know what? We are God's. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has paid a deposit. He is the deposit that God has given us, proving that we are God's. We are his possession. And you also, as a reference to Gentile believers, they first heard the gospel from Paul, and that was in Acts chapter 19. But in Acts chapter 10, 10, we actually see the first group of Gentile believers, and that was when Peter went to the house of Cornelius. I'm sure you all know the story when Peter was on the roof of the house, and three times a sheet came down with clean and unclean animals on it, and a voice from heaven said, kill and eat. And, and um, Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean. But this happened three times, and as he came out of this trance, there were men at his door waiting at the gate, waiting to fetch him, because Cornelius, a devout and a God-fearing man, a Gentile, had also heard from God, and he'd been told to send these men to the house of Simon the Tanner and to collect Peter, whom God had said would come to him. And when Peter went there, they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. They spoke in other tongues. Then they were baptized in water. This was the first Gentile believers that we hear about. You know, folks, the gospel went to the Jews first, but most of them rejected it. And then it went to the Gentiles. In John 1, verse 11 to 12, it says, God came to his own. He came to his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, he gave the right or the power to become children of God. This was the mystery of God's plan unfolding, Jew and Gentile together in one body. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers. He is given to us as salvation, as a pledge, as a deposit, folks. And it's of Gentile believers also having the inheritance, redemption and eternal life. We are sealed, and that means marked for possession or identity. We are, pos we are his possession. We are identified with him. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, it says, You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. This is the story. Now we see Paul's prayer. And oh, folks, if we would only pray the way Paul prays, Paul begins his prayer in verse 15 to 16 by telling them how he continually remembered them in his prayers, giving thanks for their faith in the Lord and their love for their saints. And then from verse 16 to 19, he prayed that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and of revelation that they might know him better. He prayed that the eyes of their heart may be enlightened so that they'd know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for those who believe. And God's power is according to the working of the strength of his might. That's his prayer for them. It's his prayer for us, folks. God's power is beyond anything that we can understand, isn't it? But we can know is the surpassing greatness of it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. In verse 20 to 23, it's God's power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in the heavenly realms at the right hand of God the Father. And it says, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus is the head of the church and all things are under his feet. You know, folks, we have leaders in our church. We have pastors. We have Ken and we have Gavin, haven't we? So they're our pastors. But you know what? They're not the head of our church. Do you know that? Christ is the head of our church. They are under his authority, under his anointing. That's who they are. So they are our pastors. They are our leaders. But he is the head of the church. We always need to remember that. Now we see the major contrast in Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. It's before, between their, our former life, and life after salvation. You know, folks, we were dead. We are now alive. 
We walked according to the devil. Now we walk in good works. We walked in the lust of the flesh and of the mind. We were objects of God's wrath, but it was because of God's great love and his mercy that he made us alive with Christ. And Romans 5 verse 8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's by grace that we have been saved. Christ raised us up and we are now seated with him in heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. It's his kindness to us, isn't it, folks? And you know, we don't see ourselves as yet seated in heavenly realms. But you know what? We are seated with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus because we are in him. It's by grace that we have been saved through faith. It is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not my works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to go, do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We work, walk in good works that God prepared for us beforehand. We were created for them. Folks, we are not saved by the good works, but when we are saved, God has prepared good works for us to walk in. And when we are saved, we will walk in those good works. We will be doing good works, but not to be saved because we are saved. Before salvation, we were called uncircumcised by the Jewish believers. They were separate from Christ. They were separated, us, the Gentiles, were separated from the covenants that God had made with the children of Israel. We were without hope and we were without God. And in chapter 3, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He broke the dividing wall of hostility that divided the Jew and the Gentile. What was the division, folks? What made us different from the Jews? It was the covenants. It was the covenants of God. It was also the law. It was the law that they obeyed. And this was a dividing wall. And Christ broke it down, didn't he? And he made the two into one new man. And in this new, one new body, he reconciled us to God. So it's by the, cross, by the cross that Jesus put to death the hostility. And through him, both Jew and Gentile now have access to God through the Holy Spirit. One body together, folks, Jew and Gentile. The Gentile believers are no longer strangers and aliens. We are fellow citizens with the Jewish believers. We are members of God's household. And God's house is built on Jesus, the cornerstone. And it says that the apostles and prophets make up the foundation from the house. But the whole building is being built together in the holy temple in the Lord. It is a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. In 1 Peter 2 verse 4 to 5, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ we are living stones we are being built folks a process being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and our sacrifices now we offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God we do this through Jesus Christ don't we the mystery has been revealed to Paul by Christ Previous generations had not known this mystery, had they? It was revealed to Christ's holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. In chapter 3, verse 6, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Grace was given to Paul to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to reveal God's mystery. Jew and Gentile in one body, the plan. This was God's plan from all eternity. And it's through faith in him that believers have freedom and that we have confidence to approach him. We come boldly to the throne of grace, don't we, folks? Before the Gentiles were out of the covenants, they could not draw near to God. But it's through faith in him that all believers, Jew and Gentile, we have freedom, we have confidence to approach him. And it says, in, in, for this reason, and this is Paul's second prayer, because of God's eternal plan and purpose, because of his mercy and grace, because of his mystery, Paul humbled himself before God the creator, and he prayed that God would grant them, us, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. He prayed for them to know the vastness of God's love 
the love that surpasses knowledge, that they would be rooted and grounded in love. And all of this, folks, was so that we would be filled up with all the fullness of God. This is Paul's desire. This is what he's saying to this church. Paul is literally a prisoner of the Lord when he's writing this letter, isn't he? But he's also a bondservant of Christ. He has chosen to give up his right to himself and to die to himself. And he is now a servant of Christ. He urges them to live a life worthy of the calling they have lived. They are to be completely humble and gentle, patient and bearing with one another in love. A message to us as well, folks. It takes diligence to preserve the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace. But he says, and this is so, folks, there is one body, there is one spirit, there is one hope of our calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. He is over all, he is through all, and he is in all. There is only one church, there is only one body of Christ, and that is the body of Christ that knows that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is not another. He now addresses each individual, and he says, to each one, God gave grace to every believer according to the measure of Christ's gifts. He gave these gifts when he ascended to his father after he was resurrected. And in chapter 4, verse 8, it says, that is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. And he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Was this so that people would have titles? Was this so that someone could say, well, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet? No, folks, what it was for was for the equipping of the saints for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. You know, a prophet, an apostle, it makes no difference who you are. You know that every gift is from God to the person, to man. And the, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, doesn't matter who you are. All you are is a channel that God is going to use. But it's from God to his body. It's not you that's important. It's the message and God's message. And it's re getting to the place where it's meant to be. That's what it's all about. This is so that the saints will become mature and no longer be tossed by every wind of doctrine. It's for the growth of the church. The Galatian church were being tempted by being, by, uh, were tempted to be tossed by every wind of doctrine, weren't they? This is what they were doing. In chapter 4, verse 14 to 16, it says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Every part of the body is important, from the youngest to the oldest, from the smallest to the biggest. You know, folks, if you are a finger, you are as important as an arm. Every part of the body of Christ is important, and we need to know that, and we are all held together. And what is it for? It's to grow and to build itself up, the church up, as each part does its work, the body of Christ. Paul tells the believer and insists on it that they no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. We are to walk in righteousness and in holiness. Before they had lived just like everyone else around them, but now they had a changed life. And they could no longer live like they had before salvation. We can't, can we, folks? In their former life, in our former life, we were separated from God because of our hard hearts and our sinful lives. And in chapter 4, verse 19, it describes these, these who were hardened, who had hard hearts and sinful lives. He says, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. They had been taught the truth, but they, and they had come to know Christ that way, that, but had been taught to put off their old self, which was being corrupted by their deceitful desires. And they were to be made new in the attitude of their minds. They were to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. They're told to put off lying and speak the truth, not to sin when they're angry because anger would give the devil a foothold, not to steal, but to work and to share with others in need. You know, folks, when you put off the old man, 
you take it and you put it aside. And to put on the new man means that you change. You put on the new. You know, when you take off your old clothes, you put them off. You put them in the wash. They get washed. And then you put them on again. And they're all clean and they're new. And this is basically what we got to do with our old sinful nature is put it off and put on the new. The new self that has been cleaned, that is created in God in holiness and in righteousness. In 20, verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, so that it may benefit those who listen. Disobedience to these instructions grieves the Holy Spirit with whom we were sealed for, for the day of redemption. You know, folks, we can grieve the Holy Spirit by disobedience, by the lives we live. And then in verse 31 and 32, we see the contrast, contrast of the old self with the new self. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every kind of malice. And verse 32, the contrast, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. In chapter five, he begins by telling us to imitate God. This is what Paul tells the believers. We are his dearly loved children, and we are to walk in love just as Christ loved us. He gave himself up for us, folks. We are his holy people, and we have to live lives as a separated from impurity or greed. It says that no such immoral person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. And all of these things belong to the former life, and they're not even to be named among the true believers. He says in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 8 to 10, we are to walk in the light, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. The former walk was one of disobedience. It was done in darkness. It was done in secret. It was unfruitful. It was shameful. And you know, folks, in 1 John 1, verse 5 to 7, it says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. We cannot walk in darkness. We need to walk in the light. We also told to live as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We to understand what God's will is for us folks and to be filled with the Spirit. And that is present tense. It means keep on being filled. It's not once. It's a keeping on. It's a process. And it's keeping on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he tells the believers to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, to sing and make music to the Lord, and to always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 21, he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes on to speak about human relationships, wives and husbands. You know, wives are to be subject to their husbands as, the, as to the Lord. They are to respect their husbands as he is the head. Husbands are to love their own wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. They are to love her as their own bodies because in marriage folks to become one flesh. Do you know something? It's very easy to a wife, for a wife to submit to a husband who loves her as Christ loves the church. And it's very easy for a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church when she sub sub is submissive to him, when she subjects to him and recognizes him as the head of the household. It's a submission Submitting one to another, isn't it, folks? Then Christ's relationship with the church is an example for marriage. He is the head and the savior of the church. It's a subject to him. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to sanctify her, to present her in glory, holy and blameless. And in chapter 5, verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. This is the mystery. Then we see children and parents after telling the children to obey their parents, Paul quotes one of the Ten Commandments in chapter 6, verse 2 to 3. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. 
Obedience is part of honoring parents. Paul tells fathers not to provoke their children to anger, to exasperate them. Don't know about you, but I had an uncle who used to exasperate us. He used to tease us so unmercifully that we actually dreaded him coming to visit. And sometimes there are parents who do that to their children. And this is what he's saying. Don't exasperate your children. Don't, don't drive them almost to anger, provoke them to anger. The father is to bring his children up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. It's the father's responsibility. Then he speaks of slaves and masters. These are believers, folks. And he says to the slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as you who are serving the Lord, not people because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And then masters, just as slaves are to obey their masters, so masters are not to threaten their slaves, but to treat them kindly and with justice, as their heavenly father, master would treat them. There's no favoritism with the Lord, folks. Then we see the spiritual warfare. We're told to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We're told to put on the full armor of God so that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. You know, folks, the devil is a murderer, a liar, and the father of lies. There's no truth in him. We see that in John 8, verse 44. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's against the devil's associates in the heavenly places. We know that Gavin has ministered to us about these. We are to put on the full armor of God so that we will be able to take our stand our ground in the day of evil. So what is the armor of God? First of all, we have the belt of truth. The gospel is the message of truth of our salvation, isn't it? And studying, God, studying God's word is a way to arm ourselves with the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, folks. Truth is in Jesus. Then we have the breastplate of righteousness. Our new self has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth and the likeness of God. The fruit of life consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. That's what we've seen in Ephesians 4 verse 24 and in chapter 5 verse 9. He is our righteousness. Righteousness is doing what's right in God's eyes, folks. It's not doing what's right in our eyes. It's being in right standing with God. That's what righteousness is. Then we have the gospel of peace. And this is the good news, the peace with God and peace with other believers. You know, the soldiers had to stand firm on his feet. And we stand firm on the gospel, don't we? It's our firm foundation. Jesus is the prince of peace. And then we have the shield of faith. You know, faith extinguishes the devil's lies, his accusations. We have been given the gift of faith. Faith in what God says enables us to know and to live in God's truth. Then we have the helmet of salvation, and we are to protect our minds, folks, by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We are to listen and to obey the voice of God. We are to hear only what God speaks. The gospel of God is the gospel, it says in Romans 1 verse 16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And then we have the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. The truth of God's word is essential for us to stand firm against the devil. Jesus used the word when he was tempted by the devil, didn't he? And you know, folks, in John 1 verse 1 and in verse 13, we know that Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what it says in John and then he, see, he ends off in chapter 6, verse 18. He says, pray in the spirit on all occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. To pray in the spirit, folks, is to pray prayers initiated and led by the Holy Spirit. We to persevere in prayer. We to keep on praying. This is how we are to pray for one another. You know, folks, at least half of this epistle is devoted to the daily walk of a Christian. It's a book of sound doctrine. It's also a book of practical application. To live out God's will as mature believers, we have to understand who we are in Christ. Paul tells us that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. We need to walk. We need to stand firm. We need to stand steadfast in Christ. This is the message of this book, the book of Ephesians.